fair question for me to be asking you. You may be thinking, Zach, I don't even know you. You're not my pastor. You don't know me. You don't know that I don't pray. But let me be clear. I'm not saying that you don't pray. I know that you probably do at certain times throughout the day, especially at meals or maybe throughout the day in the morning or in the evening. I'm not saying that you don't pray. But my guess is that there are times when you know that you should pray, that you feel led to pray, or that you sort of have it on the back of your mind that you ought to pray, but you don't. You don't pray. And you maybe know that there are routines and things you should shift around so that you can make time for prayer, but you fail to do. And the real routine, after, after all of it, is that you fail to pray. As a youth pastor, I've been guilty of ending my homilies on Wednesday night with basically saying what amounts to now read your Bibles and pray. I try to make a better application to, than just that, but that's something that I will commonly say to students. And while this is, of course, a, an old dead horse that youth pastors like to beat, there is no doubt good reason for it. We pastors know that our people fail to pray perhaps as they ought to pray because we know that if we are honest with ourselves, pray as we ought to pray. And so, again, I want to ask you, why don't you pray? What are the factors that coalesce emotionally, spiritually, physically, which frequently and habitually prevent you from deep, reverent, reflective, unceasing, and protracted prayer? This is the question I want us to have in our minds this morning as we approach God's word. But before we do that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, together now with the holy apostles and the angels, we beg you that you would teach us to pray. And so, now as we turn to your scriptures wherein we are taught to do so, we ask that you would grant that we would hear them with our ears, read them with our eyes, mark them with our minds, Learn them with our hearts, and inwardly digest them with our souls, that we may embrace and make much use of the gift of prayer which you have given to us. Seeing that you've attached your promise to hear us in the name of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God. Rediscover. 
rediscovery, this personal rediscovery of the lament psalms. It's been a gift of God also to see that the Psalter contains hymns of praise. Psalms, which we might say are full of bright exuberance. Psalms like the ones we're singing this morning. Joy and praise, they express all these sorts of emotions to the God who deserves to hear them. These hymns, such as ours from tonight, or this morning's passage, 145, this 145th Psalm, these psalms have the power to elevate our slumping, tired hearts. They give us words, they give us a voice to express our abounding joy and love that we feel for life and for God deep within our bones. Another psalm is like it, which comes from the very end of the Psalter, Psalm 150, where we read this. Praise Him with the sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud, flashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can feel the momentum building, and it crescendos at the end of the Psalter with this hymn of praise. Often the Psalms can work for us as a sort of groove, like on an old record player. Maybe they're not old to some of us, but they would be old to my generation. These grooves set in, the needles set into the groove, and it tracks with the record. And it inspires in this way uh, the deepest parts of our hearts to be expressed, and it gives us a voice, it gives us words when we may feel like we don't have the right ones. And so in this, we can express ourselves, but we're also trained through the Psalter to give words to our praise, to our hurts, to our doubts, and to our questions. There's also another phenomenon which happens when we read the Psalms. We come face to face with the worldview gap that exists between David's time and our own. Just listen to Psalm 29 and compare the ancient view of the universe to ours. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, Glory. This psalm, like the other kingship psalms, depicts a world in which God is providentially and sovereignly at work in all the big things, such as the waters and the earthquakes and the thunder and the fire. But he's also at work in the little things, such as the deer giving birth in the wilderness. And so we may confess and affirm our belief. We agree with what the Psalter is saying here, that God is in control, and we can confirm our belief using our own Belgian confession, wherein we read this. We believe that this good God, after creating all things, did not abandon them to chance or fortune, but leads and governs them according to his holy will, in such a way that nothing happens in this world without God's orderly arrangement. But I think, if we're honest, actually quite a large gap that exists between what we confess on the one hand doctrinally and what we really believe and how we actually conceive of the universe as we know it. Recently for my adult Sunday school at Amon Valley, I've been teaching a class on Christ and culture. And for this class, I've been reading and reflecting a lot on the work of a particular Canadian philosopher by the name of Charles Taylor who in his 900-page magnum opus on what it means to live in a secular age, he explains this gap between our beliefs and our actual thoughts and pre-cognitive, you might say, worldview. And he says it like this. I want to emphasize that I'm talking about our sense of things. I'm not talking about what people believe. Many still hold that the universe is created by God, that in some sense it is governed by His providence. What I'm talking about 
is the way the universe is spontaneously imagined and therefore experienced. What I'm interested in is how our sense of things, our cosmic imaginary, in other words, our whole background understanding and feel of the world has been transformed. Commenting on this observation, Calvin College professor by the name of Jamie Smith writes this. Taylor encapsulates this worldview shift as the moves move from a cosmos to a universe. The move of spontaneously imagining our cosmic environment as an ordered, layered, hierarchical shepherd in place to spontaneously imagining our cosmic environment as an infinite, cavernous, anonymous space. So 500 years ago, for example, the common worldview of the average person would have been to perceive a world in which, laying behind the material that we all know and see, there were spiritual realms, there was God, there were angels, and there were devils. But now we live in a world where belief in God is at best questioned, if not unlikely. It seems as if our world that we inhabit is, is lacking entirely God. We live not in a shepherded place, but in a cosmic or a universal space, as Smith puts it. In other words, whether we like it or not, we are inhabiting a brave new world marked by a pervasive cultural feeling of divine absence, the feeling that God is gone. He has vacated our world, our universe. This felt sense of divine absence is, I think, why we find it so hard to pray. We inhabit a world where we feel a sort of pull and tug toward an empty, empty, godless universe. And it sort of begins to feel like believing in God takes hard work, an active work of the will to struggle forward and to believe. And I'm not saying that prayer isn't hard work, because prayer is hard work. But what I'm saying is that as human beings now living in our time, in the late modern Western world, there's a certain, a certain sort of labor that goes into prayer when we do not believe or we struggle to believe that God even exists. And this differentiates our period drastically from the period of the past. <coughs> and so what we need to do, what we need to do in such a time is to return to the spiritual disciplines, such as reading scripture or giving tithes or, or sharing in our fellowship taking communion, and so on. But ultimately, the hardest thing in such, a, in such a world is to pray. Because specifically, in the act of Christian prayer, we have to shake off our doubts and our fears and our concerns that maybe, just maybe, what, was, what we're actually doing is having our words bouncing off the ceiling, and that what we're actually engaging in in prayer is a cosmic waste of time and energy. So, let's return to our question. Christian, why do you not pray? Why do you not pray? There are, of course, several different reasons for why we may not pray that we can come up with, but I would suggest that there are three categories that these reasons fall into. The first reason we may give is that it takes work. Trying to even think about what to pray for is difficult. Trying to come up with the words to pray can be hard. Especially if we're praying in a group every week at, at youth group in my church. I have the, the kids get into small groups and pray. Some of them often express fear and anxiety about this because they just don't know what to say. And I think we can all relate to that. It takes work to come up with the words about what to pray. Another reason would, would be that it maybe is boring for some of us. I know lots of students have confessed to me that prayer can seem boring. They don't know what to do. Then they get sidetracked and lost. And so staying focused is hard. Maybe 
Maybe another reason is that setting aside our other priorities can be a difficult thing to do. It takes a special act of will. The next main reason that we do not pray, I think, is that it takes time. You might think, I have to get to the office early in the morning, and I can't spare another minute. Or my kids need my attention, and I can't get away for even a moment. Or you might think, I'm constantly tired. I work so much during the day that I need to go to bed as soon as possible, so I can get all the sleep that I can. The third main reason is that we might think that it is ineffective. We might think that real action is more useful and productive than prayer. In the wake of a recent tragedy just a few weeks ago in Christchurch, New Zealand, one politician tweeted out online and said this, What good are thoughts and prayers when they don't even keep the pews safe? What good are thoughts and prayers when they don't even keep the pews safe? And though as Christians, this sort of online political grandstanding may ruffle our feathers and rub us the wrong way, I think there's a sense in which, deep down, we have internalized the same secularized view of prayer. And so I think these three reasons, the fact that it takes work, and that it takes time, and that it feels ineffective, are all symptoms of a deeper reason that we don't pray. We might think that if God even does exist, He probably doesn't listen to us. And if He listens, He probably doesn't care. And even if He cares, we doubt whether He's actually powerful enough to do anything about it. Unless you're a hermit living under a rock, we all inhabit a culture wherein everyone, Christian and non-Christian, can feel the pull and the tug and the tilt of the secular age. It's cold, empty, flat, disenchanted world. And in such a context, God's good gift of prayer may seem like nothing more than a child's toy. Fun, cute, cuddly, but easily disposed of. So at this point, you may be wondering, Zach, this sounds like a pretty bleak picture. How can we recover and bring resurrection to this practice of prayer? How can we do it? How can we return to prayer in our own lives? I want to suggest as a path forward, Proverbs 30, 7 through 9. We read this. Two things I ask of you. This is a prayer to the Lord. Deny them not to me before I die. First, remove far from me falsehood and lying. And then second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. In the second petition, in verse 8, we read this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me. The author here is essentially praying, Lord, just give me enough. All I want is just enough. But why? Why would anyone pray such a prayer? We're constantly praying for more. Lord, we need more. Why would someone pray for just enough? The answer comes in verse 9, which shows that it is because he is fearful that having too much, that he will deny the Lord and forget who the Lord is and ask, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Thus, I want to suggest that because of our world's decadence and comfort and relative ease with which we have to get our needs met, especially food, we can find food all over, and all of this shows little signs of stopping, it seems to be increasing by the day, what we need to do then, if, if we've forgotten the Lord, what we need to do then is to remember, remember which I would suggest is something like embedding ourselves in practices and in routines and in disciplines that cause us, over time, to filter out what the world tells us.
tells us, the narratives that it tells us, in exchange for the story of the living God, his chosen people, the church. And while these various ways of remembrance may include different practices, I want to suggest that the primary practice of remembrance that we should engage in is faithful, disciplined, and routine. Not prayer, but catechization. And I'm not nearly talking about catechizing our kids, although, of course, as a youth pastor, I know how important that is. We should catechize our kids. I'm just talking about this in a broader sense. We ourselves should be constantly re-catechizing ourselves. We need to be in the Word of God, day in and day out, reminding ourselves of who God is. We need to be constantly re-taught and re-narrated the story of God's Word. And so, with this in mind, we now return to Psalm 145. And as we do, I think it's, what stands out the most is that King David's exuberant and exhilarated praise and excitement is to be found in Yahweh. He is excited to sing this hymn. There is a certain joy that comes in this. And in the Psalter, this hymn kicks off the final set of six hymns, which are the grand finale of praise and loud acclamation to this book. And this is a cosmic hymn. It starts with David's own praise, it moves out to him, beckoning all of Israel to praise, and it ends with verse 21, let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. But to our 21st century Western American ears, it can still maybe sound like he's a car salesman making a pitch. The Lord upholds all who are falling, verse 14, and raises up all who are bowed down, Verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call him, to all who call on him in truth. Or verse 20, the Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. But the reality of the matter is that David's not a car salesman making false claims about God. The reality is that David knew and saw God in ways that we fail to do, that are hard for us. We would do well to remember, to remember these wonderful truths about God that David sets forth for us. So in these eight verses, we see that the Lord does several things. Verse 14, he upholds the falling and raises up the downcast. We need to remember this about our God, that when we are falling and when we are downcast, and there are going to be those moments, if we're not in one, we'll be in one. And if we're we've been in one, we're hopefully coming out of one. But there will be moments when we feel like we are falling and downcast. God upholds us. Verse 15 and 16, we see that God gives food and provision and satisfies the desires of living things. I was sitting in the garden the other day watching the birds being fed, not fed, and I was reminded of Matthew 6, where it says, you of little faith, it's not our Father feed and the sparrows. Verse 17, is right, he is righteous, God is righteous and kind. We need to remember God's righteousness, that God is a holy, righteous God who takes joy because of his kindness to give his righteousness to his people that we may be in Christ righteous. Verses 18 and 19, he is near to all who call on him and he hears the cries of his people. God comes near and he hears us. And in verse 20, he preserves his people. And he destroys the wicked. In other words, God is a God of justice. We need to be thankful for this. But for our purposes, I want to focus specifically on verses 18 and 19 this morning. And of all the theological affirmations given in this psalm, I think these two verses really come as most striking, surprising, and unbelievable for us, given what I've said about the secular world that we live in. It's all well and good to believe that God upholds and provides and preserves his people. Even the demons believe all that. But what is really counterintuitive, what is really stunning even for Christians, is David's wholehearted belief and his 
full-throated acclamation that God is near to all who call. And he's near to all who call on him in truth, and that he fulfills the desire of those who fear him, and that he also hears their cry and saves them. I think we are okay with a big God. We're okay with the transcendent God who is powerful and sovereign and overwatching the whole universe. And that he guarantees our safety and our well-being. We're okay with this God. We like that God. But we don't really know what to do with the God that comes close. With the God who is near. It's sort of like when our friends come a little too close. We've all probably had those situations where we're catching up with an old friend and things are going well, and then they ask the question that you didn't want to be asked. How are you really doing? What's really going on in your life? What are you struggling with recently? We don't like that very much. We don't like it when they come that close. But more importantly, I think we just sort of find it hard to believe in our world that God does come close. Even if he's there at all, we wonder if he even does come close. And if our prayers are really just, again, bouncing off the ceilings and returning to us void. And that we're just wasting our time away in our prayer closets. So one of the primary ways to combat this feeling, to remember, is by steeping ourselves in these truths. That the Lord is near. The Lord is near to his people. And that he does hear their cries and he saves them. And this is indeed great news. God is not only transcendent and big and sovereign and powerful, but God comes close. He comes near to me and to you. He hears our prayers. We may think of what David says in Psalm 9, or Psalm 8, excuse me. What is man that you are mindful of? When I look upon the stars in the sky and I think about the grandeur of the universe that we live in, what is man who are mindful of him? God comes close. The greatest proof of all of this, of course, is in what we're celebrating today on Palm Sunday, that Christ has come close, that his kingdom has been inaugurated, it has been started, he has ridden into his kingdom. He is called Emmanuel, which, as you know, means God with us. Not just God above us, but God with us. And that his name also is Jesus, which means God saves. So God comes close and he saves us. We see the celebration of this proof that God comes close to his people in order to redeem them in Zechariah's great hymnic prophecy in Luke 1. Now, this is Zechariah of the New Testament, not the prophet of the Old Testament. And he says this, and hearing the news that his son, John the Baptist, would be born as a prophet for Christ. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. He says this when he hears the news that God's promises, given long ago, were now going to be fulfilled before his very eyes. And it's proof for us that God has visited us. That God has redeemed us. And he has saved us and delivered us in Christ. And this is what we celebrate every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper. That Christ draws near, not just to be outside of us, that he draws near to be inside of us. 
And if this is true, Christian, if this is true, that Jesus comes close to his people, tell me again, why don't you pray? Why don't you pray? This is just as much a question for myself as it is for all of you. If God comes near, and if God hears us when we cry out to him in truth, we not only should pray, to pray. And so it's fitting, I want to do this in closing, I want to share with you the words from the very last question and answer of our catechism, the Heidelberg Catechism. This is also the conclusion of the catechism's exposition or explanation of the Lord's Supper. And the very last question we find there is this. What does the little word Amen Express. And the answer, Amen, means this shall surely and truly be. It is even more sure that God listens to my prayer than that I really desire what I pray for. It is even more sure that God listens to my prayer than that I even desire what I pray for. This is God's view. Good news that God listens to us. We've all prayed prayers which we earnestly were desiring for the healing of a friend, for the power to move on after a hardship, for peace in a time of grief. We've all prayed things earnestly. Maybe we've prayed things unearnestly, but I know we've prayed things earnestly before God. And if we've ever really desired anything, and if we make our petitions known to the Lord, we can be certain and fully assured, says the Catechism, that our God listens to us. Though we may feel as if our prayers are bouncing off the ceiling, we can be sure that God himself, who shepherds and reigns the cosmos, listens to us. And this is good news, Christian. This week, make much use of the gift of prayer. Return always to God's word. Remember who God is and the fact that he listens to you. And that God acts mightily on behalf of his people to save them, to deliver them, to bless them. O oh Lord, our God, we are thankful to you for holding us up, for providing for us, for preserving us day and night. We thank you for your word and how it helps us to remember you. It reigns us back in. It causes our minds to turn to you. But most of all, Lord, we are thankful for the immeasurable grace which you have given to us in Jesus Christ our Lord that you have come close to us in him. May we learn to grow in faith and in faithful prayer, and also may we learn to walk